talked about uh, theory, but we really didn't go so deep into theory. I think it was one. But the idea is for you to find a theory which speaks to your discipline. Because a theory of teaching chemistry and learning chemistry will not be the same at, at, uh, as one for teaching history. So once we move, looked at the learning theories, we are now into the design. Last week, we had started on how the question is, how do you design these learning environments and learning context and learning activities and assessment? We are kind of rushing through it, if you can, because you need a little bit more time. But as I said, we're just pointing out onto, onto what needs to be done. So at the design level, we are really emphasizing two things. Last week, we tried to emphasize constructive alignment, that when you do your stuff, make sure that they are speaking to each other so that you assess what you plan and that they all co are coherent. Now today, we are going to look at outcomes-based learning and graduate attributes. So the reason we do that is UWC has taken a position that no matter which area of teaching you are going to be in, all our students should be under, uh, informed by what we mean by graduate attributes. So that you, you feel you, 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 you hear us emphasizing this over and over again. Because this is the type of student we are engaging, uh, uh, going to involve in. Aruna is going to talk a little bit more uh, about that. Now the other thing we also want you to look at is you'll notice that UCT or your reference Stellan Bosch, UWC has got a kind of different context. So that's why it's, it's important to understand the context that we are in. And another driver that you see that we are trying to drive is the use of technology tools. And we know we are at different levels, but then we can't run away from it. This is the era of using technology. So that striving of pushing into those spaces of, of making sure that these groups are online instead of face-to-face -face is simply because that is where the generations are acting. If you look at your students now, most of them are very technology driven. So we're trying to push ourselves. It might be similar and comfortable for some of us, but at least for some of us. The other idea is also, of, of course, is because we never have enough time. So some of the conversations we think should not only be start and end here, but we're trying to bring a conversation. So the groups that we are in, we are hoping that they will not <coughs> only stop now, but we we'll push them further so that we develop communities of practice. So that you just take it that, okay, I'm now finished using my group, but you go on, go on conversing about uh, the other context. So that, that's that give you a little bit of idea. Yeah. So we, basically, that's where we're trying to go with this whole um, um, <coughs> portfolio development phase. Now, any questions? So today, as I said, we are going to go a little bit deeper into the learning outcomes and the graduate attributes because those are very important. And by at the end of this session, this is what we want you to do. To identify two or three learning outcomes, but which are related to the graduate attributes. That's why we have put a list on your desk. And then to at least start developing an activity or <clears throat> and an assessment task which is aligned to your learning outcome and, and to your graduate attributes. You might feel that we are repeating ourselves, but from years of experience, we have learned that sometimes you say something, but when you start doing it and articulating it, it takes a different kind of shape. So we are trying to do things together so that we can also critique each other and then improve our, our practice. So this is what we are all going to do today. Okay. Now I just want us to take us some new, few minutes because this has always been a very key question when we are teaching. And I just want us to maybe two, three minutes and let's just come to start a conversation. What is the difference between knowledge and understanding? Because this is always where we're debating, yes? Well, how does it mean to use the first thing, what and why? What, which one is which? Knowing is what, understanding is why. Okay, yeah, that's one. Any other, yeah? Yeah. 
and ask this question because this is a question that we always have to address. I want my student to know, but I really want my student to understand. So what it is, and today we're going to try to go through it very quickly. This is only one definition, so it doesn't have to, to be that. But usually, in higher education, we are really concentrating on the cognitive. Yes, the physical and the thing is also important, but we are really now shaping the mind. So mo most of our processes are really cognitively fine. So there is an understanding, a clear and certain mental uh, apprehension. And I took this from this book. If you have some time, I'm also still reading it. I've never managed to go through it. But it says understanding by design. And I think this is, uh, for me, it makes a little bit sense about what the difference is. So understanding seems to be a little bit more. It involves making connections and binding together our knowledge into something that makes sense of things to be able to wisely and effectively use transfer what we know. That is just one definition. But the idea is, and why am I emphasizing? Because when you're writing outcomes, it's very important that you know what you are targeting. Is it knowledge? Is it understanding? And I, I know with Bloom we always argue, maybe we, we take out the word understand. Why people take it out is because it's not defined very clearly. But if you use it and you know exactly what it is defining, that those two are, are very are critical for you to, to use. When we are drawing these outcomes, we use Bloom's taxonomy. Some people prefer solo, but Bloom, I think, has been consistent throughout. And the reason it has been very useful is because he gave us a way of, these groups of people gave us a way of organizing learning so that it made sense. The original taxonomy, if you see, concentrated on knowledge. That's why you could move from knowledge, which is at a very low level, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So some people prefer to use that old one, and it's okay. The way you organize your, your, your learning is really up to you. The newer revised version I like because it has split the whole information into two, two uh, segments. One is a knowledge dimension, whereas the other one is a cognitive processing. And as I said, in higher education, we are really interested in this, in this one. But we should not forget what type of knowledge, because there is factual knowledge, there is conceptual knowledge, which is a little bit higher, there's procedural knowledge for the skills, and then there's also metacognitive knowledge where the person now thinks about how they are learning or how it informs them. So when you are writing these outcomes, you should first ask yourself, what type of knowledge am I really addressing? Is it low facts? Is it concepts? Is it procedures? Or is it something a little bit higher? But then after that, you then have to ask your question about what the student will be doing. So this is where the outcome statement comes in very strongly. Do I just want my students to remember? Do I want them to understand? And this is where the understanding has to be broken down. So that's why most people say, leave the word understanding because sometimes it's not clear. Because do you mean, is it explaining? Is it inferring? Is it discussing? Is it getting So you must make sure that the verb that you use is clear to yourself and your student. So as you level up to the hard cognitive level, the highest one is creation. And that's where we are, wanting, we are wanting to go. We want students to be able to build something new, to create something new using so all this knowledge. But they can't get to that level unless they have really mastered the lower ones. So as I said, Bloom's is, is really a taxonomy that can help you do those two things. Look at the knowledge dimension and then ask yourself, what is it that I want my students to be <coughs> able to do? So what are these learning outcomes? They're really guidelines. They just give us their great guidelines, and they also give us a common understanding, not only for the lectures, but for the students. That's why when you prepare your module outline, supposedly you prepare it at the beginning, you're supposed to give it to your students so that you and your students know exactly what you are aiming for. So they're aimed at the students even more than for the lecture. So the students should already know what is it that they're aiming for. And I like this, what Arona got from Houghton. He said, we must have a clear idea 
of what we want students to be able to do at the end of a unit of study and then we get this intended learning outcomes to students so that they can at least share in the responsibility of achieving them. So the outcomes is a blueprint of where you want to go but expressed in a very clear format so that your students understand what it is that they are looking for. So for example, and these are the things that you're looking for, because we're going to write one or two outcomes. If you write a good outcome, it should be smart. So it should be very specific and clear. It should be meaningful. It should be appropriate. So you don't want something which is very low or something which is very high. It should also be realistic and it should be testable. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that all have to be skill driven. But the brother said, even if I understand it, you have to write it in a way that makes it clear. And this is a, a caution of warning. We haven't brought the SACWA uh, levels, but I think we all know that in higher education, we're starting from level five up to level 10. So please, when you are devising, you look at the SCHE, if you have some time, um, our the website, and try to see that you do not put your students through something which is a little bit too high. So there's some, you aim at, at a level five, you're aiming at the foundation. As they go to second year, it's level six, and as they go to, to, to third year, it's level seven. So that means the knowledge, uh, the, the types of problems that you're giving them, and their responsibility of learning should differentiate between the two. <coughs> we're not going to do that, we're going to that much, but that's just a question. And lastly, before we are going to get some time now to develop some outcomes, I'm just giving you an idea of, for instance, a course I was developing for academics like yours on evaluation. <coughs> These were my students who are academics like you. So some of them have got PhDs, some of them are professors, and some of them are newly. But I have, I've had to think about what is it that I want them to do. And all I'm trying to show you is that before I write the outcomes, and we might all value different things, I have to th think very deeply about what my goal is. So for instance, for this short program, all I wanted was them to be able to design a basic program evaluation. And on the right hand stars, these are the kinds of post questions I was asking myself. What kind of concepts are needed? What is it am I going to concentrate on? Because I know they must have a knowledge of some science of evaluation, they must know the logic of different evaluation designs, they must have understanding of the measures that are going to be used. These are questions that are going on in my mind, but if you see down, I'm not writing them in my outcomes. Why? Because these outcomes are supposed to be the exit level outcomes of the module. So they're not very specific to, you know, but they are kind of broad. So if you see what I've chosen, and this is what I value, somebody else will choose another one. I've chosen, the first one is that they should be able to differentiate between valid and invalid studies. Now, it doesn't mean that I leave all those things, but it means that I can make that outcome, I can break it up in what we call assessment criteria. So I can break it up into small points so that I can address the type of learning. I look at the second one, I want them to critically review an evaluation design model for its appropriateness to a given situation. So they must understand what logic design is, they must understand the different. So as I said, this exit level outcomes is written broadly, but I can later on uh, break it down into the types of assessment and into the types of learning activities that I want my students to learn. And then the last one is design and evaluation. So as I said, this is the strong introduction we're giving you to learning outcomes. And what we want now for you to do, if unless you have any question, we want you now to take a few minutes to do that. If you can just select a learning outcome from your body. Because we don't want to go through all of them, we want you to select one which is a bit problematic for you. And the reason, because when you write it, you can now exchange and look at it and see if it makes sense or you don't feel comfortable with. And we want you to reformulate it using those SMITE guidelines. So can we take a few minutes to do this? 
And let's do much question. Yeah. Hmm? Which one? To the activity. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So take just pick of one outcome. Yeah. Please take one outcome. If you haven't brought one, just start taking one. Because we now we want to share the outcome with each other. Yes, yes. We want you to do it now because we want to exchange and see what is going on. You start with the course. Can everyone hear me? That's a title of love. We've dealt with graduate attributes briefly at the beginning of the course. And what I want to do is just recap a little bit and then actually get you working with graduate attributes and um, <clears throat> working more with aligning. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, so that you're just grappling with it a little bit more. Um, so I know there are very different levels here of familiarity with graduate attributes, so, so just bear with me. Um, I just wanted to um, to run through quickly the, some of the background to why graded attributes have become such a focus. And um, in terms of the international context, the, um, the role of universities um, has changed very dramatically. Um, and universities have had to clarify the the nature of the contribution that they make and what their graduates have to offer. <coughs> and then there's a, the issue of how higher education interfaces with the world of work um, and the needs of the economy and the type of graduates that are being produced. Issues about employability of the graduates that are being produced. And then the, the, not just employability, but also citizenship, which are very sort of defined as having an informed concern for one's role in society, and we'll talk more about that. And then there's an issue, the issue of adapting to a changing and uncertain world, and the need for lifelong learning, which is related to that. <clears throat> um, then in relation to South African institutions specifically, we have a, we have a phenomenon phenomenon of um, unemployed graduates, a lot of unemployed graduates, um, while there's a pressing skills need, so there's that mismatch that's happening. Um, then the need to compete and participate in a globalized world, um, the need for citizenship attributes and orientation to the social good, which, um, which in our country is um, you know, it's a, it has a very particular kind of history and, um, and nature that we need to address. The, the other issue is the perceptions at UWC specifically, the perceptions of UWC graduates. And um, yeah, you, you get to hear people saying things in some fields about UWC graduates that, that, that are a bit worrying. Um, but I really like this definition of employability because it's a very, it's, it's quite a nuanced way of talking about um, the attributes that are required. Um, <coughs> it goes well beyond the simplistic notion of key skills and is evidenced in the application of a mix of personal qualities and beliefs, understandings, skillful practices, <coughs> and the ability to reflect productively on experience in situations of complexity and ambiguity. Um, and then, um, you know, we, the, there's the issue of generic graduate attributes, which we, we have the UWC Charter of Graduate Attributes, which are graduate attributes that could apply um, in any in any field and um, any sort of field of work that one goes into, um, and um, 
the, the, these are the quality skills and understandings the university community <coughs> that these the students should develop. Um, I, I, think that, I think that also I got a little bit confused because talking about generic graduate attributes, when you look at the, um, the, the, the charter of the UWC graduate attributes, which, which you can have a copy of, <coughs> There's a there's a tier there's a first tier which um, which consists of the generic graduate attributes and which are the, which are the kind of uh, broad overarching attributes that that a university would want its students <coughs> to um, to develop um, and they go beyond the disciplinary expertise or technical knowledge that has traditionally formed the core of most university courses. They are also qualities that prepare graduates as agents of social good in an unknown future. Um, and then there are different there are different approaches and understandings of what graduate attributes are. And Simon Barry, who's um, who's an expert in graduate attributes at Sydney University. And he has really influenced the way that, that we formulated graduate attributes at UWC. Um, sees graduate attributes as being embedded in the curriculum rather than being additional outcomes or extracurricular expectations, which some people see, see graduate attributes as. But does that make sense? <coughs> okay, then, then in terms of these, these tiers of graduate attributes, um, th this, is, this is like a summary of, of the chart of graduate attributes and the two tiers. So the, the tier one is the overarching attributes, the complex interwoven aspects of human ability. The, 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 attributes to do with prospering in an uncertain world of change um, and, and lifelong learning. And then the scholarship, citizenship, and the social good. And then the tier two, um, classes of personal skills and abilities. I also want to say that I, that I conceptualize these two tiers a little bit differently to how you may see them in some of the in some of the documents because this makes more sense to me that the tier one is the overarching ones. Um, tier two um, is, um, is about the inquiry focused and knowledgeable, critically and relevantly literate, autonomous and collaborative, ethically, environmentally and socially aware and active, skilled communicators and having interpersonal flexibility and confidence to engage across difference. And when we talk about embedding graduate attributes into our curricula and aligning graduate attributes, we are actually talking about those six in tier two. That because, because of tier one being so overarching and the ones in tier two will make up those overarching graduate attributes, but these are kind of more most concrete attributes that you can um, you can integrate into your specific discipline and curriculum in, con in concrete ways. Yeah. I want to just want to ask, what is relevantly literate in? Particularly literate in what levels? What forms of literacy do you want emotional literacy, psychological literacy? Okay. Okay. Well. Um, it's, it's probably better if you're looking at the actual charter rather than this, because this is, this is just a summary. But um, I guess that it's about, um, like if, you, if you're literate and you're able to read and write, for example, but are you able to, to read the kind of material that you need to read in your context? Um, Literacy is not a decontextualized thing. And in this discipline, you would need to be, you need to be literate in a particular way to be able to engage with the discipline. Does that answer the question? There's, there's, there's a different ways of looking at it. Like, for example, concentrated more information 
other people really digital. So that is why it's very encompassing. So we are saying in your own area, what are the literacies that are very important? Because the literacies of somebody with CHS might not be the same as the literacies of somebody with CHS. Are there any questions at this point? straight into the task from here. So. I, I, okay, and then in terms of alignment, you did um, you did alignment um, two weeks ago, sorry. Um, and so this diagram is really just showing the need for alignment between all these elements of the curriculum. Um, and this is also, this is just so showing that it's not a linear process. That um, the that, for example, the um, the learning objectives or outcomes which feed into the learning activities, assessment tasks, etc. And then it would um, you know those would be evaluated and influence your learning outcomes. Then, and now when, when we started um, actually trying to operationalize these learning outcomes um, at UWC, and um, the, just the <coughs> time, I think it was 2009, that the, 2010, that the, that the charter was developed, and then people were grappling with, well, what does it mean to actually integrate this into one's courses? Um, and this is, um, this is what um, Prof. Delia Marshall from the science faculty developed is um, she, she listed the UWC graduate attributes on the left <coughs> of a table and then she broke that down into a number of learning outcomes with teaching and learning activities which <coughs> when she developed those outcomes um, and then, and then Put in assessment tasks and criteria. Um, so, so this is this is an example um, of how this can be done. Um, now, I am, and I, I found that this way of it's like a hierarchical structure where the, where the graduate attributes form the form the essential driving. Um, features of the of the course, and then the learning outcomes flow from the graduate attributes. The work to make up those graduate attributes. Um, I struggle to work with that, and I think that that some other people have as well. Um, th this was something that was developed in um, sports, recreation, and exercise science where the learning outcomes of a module were like the, the driving features, then um, the, the graduate attribute, then for each learning outcome, there would be a number of graduate attributes that would be developed. And the fact that it's just kind of ticked here is incidental, it's just a kind of shorthand way of, um, of, of representing it. Um, and then with the with the teaching activities um, linked to the well, well she's done a whole lot in one um, in one row in one column sorry um, but yeah then the teaching activities and then the assessment tasks which linked to that so I think that I think that really one has to find a way that that works for your courses and that and find a way of conceptualizing graduate attributes with learning outcomes that that works for you. 
Um, the, only, the only problem with that is that if everyone, like if you develop in module outlines and people in your department are using different ways of representing it, then it's going to be confusing for students. So I think that at least within a, within a department, one should have a, um, a standard framework for, for representing it. Are there any questions or comments at this stage? Yeah. Yes, I'm just thinking, when I look at this module and... Um, Can people hear? Yeah. Okay. Can you talk louder? And I just want to find out, uh, as, as maybe, is it that uh, maybe the, the, the GAs were <coughs> listed first ahead and then it's afterwards for one year to two, two as one, two, three, four, five, six, or was it this for, for the students, or you know, was it designed for the students to, to see, or because I'm trying to understand, is it not better to us have them on the same, you know, as I'm trying to, 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 to understand if ever that there is somewhere which the, the uh, the, 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 the value were first listed because I can see their learning outcomes and the, the, there are ticks there. As I'm trying to understand if the, there is a part where those uh, GAs are listed first so that, 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 that students can see and make some kind of connection with that. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether you're saying that Okay. That the, what those actual graduate attributes are oh, yes. spelled out. So yes, I'm saying when they spelled out first before, so students can just make some kind of connection and say, oh, okay, the one is this. Yeah. And all them, yeah, you know, what's this done? Well, well, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how to use this. But okay. look, in the first place, when you do something like this, it's for you to be conceptualizing your groups. Okay. And the language of your course. So if you just go to the, you know what it means. You're working with the graduate attributes and you know what is one and two, and etc. Then when you do something for your students, you, you have to work on what is a clear way of doing this with your students. And and what however you do it, you need to actually mediate that with your students and talk to them about it. I, I think people need to keep talking to students about graduate attributes. Otherwise, they don't know what they are, and it's, it's just meaningless. So just to have a table like this is, is not enough. Yeah. Sorry, I can see this. I don't quite like this framework for a module. But I was wondering about, um, you know, students say we do a two-year course in the eight modules. Uh, yes. One year for advanced certificate or advanced diploma, for example. So, so those attributes, instead of, it sounds like it could become just a ticking exercise of yeah. trying to form too much in this. How would you um, look at it more realistically across the course of a number of modules? So how, how would you look at it across the module with graduate attributes more realistically? You know, instead of it becoming just an exercise where you're trying to make sure you cover all bases, mm -hmm. you we did that when we started this process in our department we had this that exact issue was that graduate attributes aren't module specific they're course specific um, and we actually we put together a really big excel document that maybe isn't so user friendly and we looked at each module and each graduate attribute and then we also had our professional board requirement attributes and we graded each graduate attribute from novice to expert so we had like a three grade system so in first year in this module they did these graduate attributes on a novice level, level and then in second year in that way it mapped it out but it gave us also the knowledge that we were doing it all in our program so from first to fourth year they were going from novice to Let's call it an expert, however you grade it. But that helped, that breaking it down into different levels 
and then it, it made it, we, it really helped in our department to actually conceptualize for ourselves but then also be able to share that with the students. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also more at an advanced level of what we're doing here because we're first getting people to integrate graduate attributes in their modules and to get their heads around that. But what they should be doing is actually what occupational therapy did about three years ago is, is integrating them at a program level or within a degree. Um, thinking about how you develop that progression so that your graduates end up with those kind of attributes. Moving on to the task, which um, is develop a learning activity and assessment task that are aligned to a learning outcome and graduate attributes. Um, I don't, I don't know if this, I don't know if this task is clearly enough to find, because I just don't, um, yeah, if you have a problem with this, then speak to us. Um, we, you know, we were thinking about asking you to do it within those kind of tables, like the two different tables which you have on your But we actually want you to discuss it more than just putting them into a table. So it's, it's just really to, to engage with it and to generate discussion around it. 